you know, all the interesting, weird little things on our records like like that were usually a Jeremy idea. He has like really cool ideas when it comes to things like that, that will add to songs and make them like, just make them stand out more like that. And so I trusted him. I was like, you know, worst case, we can just delete it. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Record Process. This week, we invite founding member and former lead guitarist of the band A Day to Remember to the show, Mr. Tom Denny, to talk with us about the band's 2009 record, Homesick. This was the album that really put the band on the map and exploded their career, and Tom had a ton to do with the writing of that record. We get into the details of how the record was demoed and written while the band was on tour, and what the process was like for them working with producer Chad Gilbert of the band Newfound Glory and producer Andrew Wayne. After we unpack the history of that album, we also go on to talk about Tom's career as a songwriter, working with a number of other artists since then, including Neck Deep. We talk a little bit about that experience and so much more. So don't go anywhere. The interview's coming right up after this quick message about our sponsors. When the world shut down in 2020, musicians and producers everywhere were forced to re-examine and reimagine their creative process. Without the possibility of in-person studio collaboration, the future of music production was anything but certain. But as the old saying goes, where there's a will, there's a way. And for those professionals who were determined to never compromise on the quality of their audio, the world-class engineers at Audio Movers established that way. By combining the HD streaming of lossless multi-channel audio straight from your DAW with the unique ability to adjust latency and bitrate, Listen To stands as the solution to unlocking global creativity in music production. Its power has been felt on Grammy award-winning albums and on over 85% of all modern Abbey Road studio sessions. So stop letting your physical location dictate the quality of your work and the projects within your reach. For a free trial, just follow the link in our show notes and use the code PROCESS to receive 10% off the first year of your membership. Listen, if you're an artist or musician still struggling to find a better way to distribute and promote your music and you haven't checked out DistroKid yet, then that needs to jump straight to the top of your to-do list. We are proud to have them back with us for another season of The Record Process, primarily because they, just like us, are committed to empowering and supporting independent artists like you. DistroKid is by far the most affordable service for distributing your music to all digital streaming platforms, and it comes with a bunch of tools to help you elevate your career in a ton of crucial ways. DistroKid not only allows you to spread your music across the streaming ecosystem, regardless of what platform might be top of your focus right now, but it also helps you share your story with labels using their unique upstream tool. You can engage with your fan base using DistroKid's text messaging feature, and they'll even help you create unique lyric videos that can help you promote your music better online. As a record process listener, you can get 30% off of your first year's membership just by heading to the show notes and signing up using our affiliate link there. And remember, we always love hearing what you're working on and how tools like DistroKid are helping you create some incredible moments for your fan base. So please don't hesitate to share them with us. And now here's our interview. Mr. Tom Denny, welcome to the record process. Thank you for joining us, dude. How you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. I can see you're in the studio right now. Is that your home setup? Yeah. Oh, okay. Lovely. And where are you based out of right now? Uh, still, still in Florida or? Yeah. Ocala, Florida. Ocala. Dude, I love that. Um, I see you're a Focal man. <laughs> yes, I am. Very cool. <laughs> we'll try to, we'll, uh, we'll save uh, the gear talk for uh, our gear candy segment at the end that we always do with everybody. I, I have a feeling you'll probably have some cool answers on that regard. But the primary reason that we we're really excited to have you here and and have a chat with you was to zero in on some of your songwriting chops and that perspective as both a guitar player and just uh, getting in the room with a band, specifically A Day to Remember and your role as both songwriter, guitar player and 
everything in between on the 2009 record Homesick um, that obviously if anybody's familiar with ADTR um, it would be hard not to be uh, in this world and specifically this record Tom and I were just talking um, you know the opening track on that uh, pretty ubiquitous when it comes to uh, the umbrella of scene and pop punk and everything that that band has come to represent so pretty iconic stuff I looked it up I was like the the play counts alone I was like listening to it I was like damn <laughs> take us back to you know that time I you know leading up to that and let's start by just uh, maybe giving our, our listeners a little bit of you know a, a quick like 30 second little background thing of you know how you came to be in the band and you know the records leading up to uh, to writing of homesick uh yeah so I started the band in when was it 2003 I think and I was in like a I joined like a local band in Ocala when I was younger that was kind of like heavier and I was like new to like heavy stuff you know I was always like punk rock or in pop punk you know that's like that's what I grew up on so I joined this like heavier band that got me like more introduced into like hardcore and breakdowns and stuff and but I wasn't really digging the band so I took the drummer and the bass player and I started a day to remember and basically took like the best band members of all the local bands in Ocala that I could possibly find and yeah so that's how the band started basically I started the band to be more pop punk and be you know more melodic and you know Neil and Josh and Jeremy too for the most part were big hardcore fans and like I said I didn't grow up on hardcore so you know our compromise for when we started writing a lot was to you know find a way to just mishmash like the, what they want and what I wanted so that's why like our first record is like real some some of it's like real dramatic it's like you know like a whole pop punk song straight into a breakdown it really yeah. makes no sense when I listen to it now. <laughs> but at the time it was just like our way of like finding finding our genre and finding out what we, what we wanted to do you know yeah and i feel like homesick was the first record that like I feel like we nailed it you know what i'm saying like the first our first record and the name was treason was it's kind of a mess, you know? I think people like it for, like, nostalgia reasons. I listen to it and cringe, obviously. Because, like, you know, there's just a lot going on, and it's not very balanced. Our second record, for, for those who have heart, was a little better. But it was still, you could still tell that we were trying to figure things out, you know? But when Homesick, like, I don't know, we, we were touring, like, a lot. Like, 200, 250 days a year leading up to recording that record and we were writing constantly on tour i think that also influenced the record a lot obviously it's called homesick we were gone for like years right so you know it was just it was the first time I, like i felt like we did what you know we were all trying to accomplish as far as songwriting goes dude what a great job like kind of like rolling out that uh the whole story and the lead up to homesick but also like let's jump in right there writing on tour not a thing that uh at least for myself i've ever been i've ever really felt like i was able to do super successfully we've tried a bunch with, like with wonder years um it's it becomes a necessity when you're when you're putting in those kind of um you know those kind of tour hours right around an entire year but yeah I, it feels like so then in that way the the writing kind of spawned at least you had you knew what where you wanted to go from a topic right um you know obviously like the name of the record as it says but uh i think a lot of times bands struggle with like what are we going to write like wh how's it going to be honest how's it going to be authentic that was kind of just there you're writing on tour you're literally feeling that way so the songs and the concepts uh, i guess drudged up in that way in, in a really authentic manner right yeah 100 percent. i think that's one of the reasons that record feels so authentic is because it absolutely was you know like we were like we were stressing in the back of the bus that we couldn't afford, but we got a bus to write <laughs> specifically. You yeah, know? yeah. You're stressing out, writing this shit. Everybody's missing their girlfriends, their family, um, fighting. You know, you know how it is. Like when yeah. you're on tour for that long, and you can like feel it in in the record. And I feel like that's why it probably feels so so real to some people because like it wasn't a choice to write homesick like, you know, uh, about the struggles of being gone and, and all that. But it's just like, 
it just manifested itself, you know, and I think that's that's why it turned out that way. Yeah, I I'm certainly sure of it. Yeah. So, Tom, what did that process look like on the bus? Like, could you walk us through like <laughs> like like a bus is only so big. So like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like so basically the very the back lounge was the the writing room. You know what I'm saying? And Andrew Wade came out with us for a couple tours and we had like a laptop and like a shooting interface. And it was just like me and Jeremy in the back, just writing, basically doing pre-production and writing at the same time. Chad from Newfound Glory, who produced that record, we did a tour with Newfound Glory right before we went to the studio. So he was in there with us doing pre-production producing on the songs as we're writing them oh wow so yeah basically like we spent uh, however many months it was in that in the back room you know ha- no fun time on tour it's ba- Dude. You know, i wake up go to the back start working play a show get off stage go to the back work until i'm tired and we fall asleep and wait it's like rinse and repeat you know so it was like it was just a lot of work. It really took a lot out of me. That's truly remarkable. And anybody that's listening, it's like, oh, well, like you're on the butt. It's like, no, first of all, it's amazing that everybody could keep the back lounge clear enough to actually work back there, which is one like any like bus life. It's like, get your shit out of the lounge. Like, um, like during the day, it just like piles up, you know, with like bullshit that you're like i didn't even know we had this much crap on the bus like and now everybody's throwing shoes backpacks you know luggage back there so that is uh in and of itself an accomplishment that y'all were able to like keep space for that but on top of it that's dude that's amazing i didn't know that you kind of had for as tough as it was to put in that many that that many hours in that long a day you had the two people that you were working with um, to produce the album there with you on tour. At least they were in the trenches, which is actually really unique. The fact that you were out with Newfound um, and that Chad could be there, could pop in and like from day to day, like hear ideas as they were coming up and run with them. And it wasn't like, OK, let's work up a batch of stuff, send them off to somebody somewhere else wait, see what they think, then get like an email back or jump on the phone. Were there any moments where, you know, you remember like feelings, you know, some some aspects of a song or like a part or an idea come together that um, that maybe, w- you know, wouldn't have been been able to come to come together like that if y'all hadn't been together on that tour? Yeah, I, I mean, I think most of that record was that, you know, because like, you know, having Chad and Andrew there for the creation of most of the songs, some some were written prior than, you know, to us all getting together, but like writing the songs together with them, it just really, it created like a, an environment that like I wasn't used to. And by doing so, I feel like it created more like songwriting opportunities and songs turned out differently for the better because of that, you know, just the, just like the pressure in my head of having Chad there to come in, tell me if he likes something or wants to change something or not, just like the thought of it uh, forced me to think outside of my comfort zone. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and because of that process, I, I learned a lot, um, writing that way. And I feel like have, you know, since applied, that thinking or that the way of of writing in that environment to how I've written ever since it was it really impacted my life for sure dude that's amazing so you kind of um because you had um you know someone like Chad and and Andrew and Jim like showing up every day doing that um you kind of had like uh what I actually kind of started referring to as like an accountability collaborator before it's even like a co-writer or producer just somebody be like yo this person's going to show up on the bus at this time. Like, yeah. let me at yeah. least try to have something going or based on whatever conversation, you know, had been um, marinating for the last 24 hours or whatever. You're like, well, I got to at least take a stab at like what we talked about, you know, um, which yeah, is really like sure. implementing that kind of shit very quickly um, yeah. and not uh, just procrastinating it. Like it's so much easier if you're like at home in the studio, just be like, ah, I don't know, I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah. I got to Like I got some stuff I can I can edit this. I can mix, you know, whatever. Um, you're right there. There's nowhere to hide. Right. Yeah. Um, you either pick 100%. up a guitar or don't. Um, what were some of the, um, you know, like I, I guess maybe like even talk like techniques, obviously like chat 
Chad writing for years with Newfound and having worked with a lot of other bands, I'm curious, like what that day to day thing um, brought you in terms of your like songwriting technique and perspective, um, maybe even unpack how, how some of those things came together uh, for you, maybe like from like a structure verse like fragment was it were you trying to like get a whole like rough structure of a song together or were you just trying to like spill out a bunch of ideas really quickly each day um yeah so like how i've always written even bef- before uh maybe not before but i would say right before we started writing for homesick like I- i've always written I've tried to write, like, I try to write full songs, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I, I'm not a part writer kind of person. Like, I, I do a lot of writing in my head before I even pick the guitar up. So I'll like, you know, I'll try to think of a concept and have maybe like a riff or something in my head. And, and, and then, you know, uh, uh, when I work, cause it's, it's, it's also different when I write by myself, cause I'm like, recording myself but like back then when i was when we were on the bus and like we had andrew recording and stuff i always tried to like come into the situation with like a verse a pre-chorus and a chorus and then we build from those you know like we, i lay those down as fast as possible and i i 99 of the time if i have a rhythm i'll have a lead i'll have a drum beat i have it all in my head already so i just i can do it really fast and then chad would come in and he would, uh, what I really liked about working with him and what I learned a lot from him was how he like, he would completely change structure, structures of like songs. Like, so he would take like, he would be like, this chorus sounds like the intro and this bridge should be the chorus. And like, I wouldn't, I, I never would have thought of that, you know, and he did it a few times on that record. And I'm glad he did like the songs like are totally different now, but when I listen to him, like I can't imagine him the way that they used to be. So I, I don't know. I learned a lot from him on structuring things and like thinking outside of the box, thinking about parts differently, you know, because like in my head, when I'm writing, when I come over the chorus, that's the, that's the chorus. You know what I'm saying? It's like hard for me to like, yeah, to unthink that way. It's just how I write. You know what I'm saying? So like having somebody else to come in with a different thinking process and be like, this shouldn't be the course. This should be something else. I don't know. Really like it was a cool, it was a cool thing to see, you know? And it's so helpful. And I think so many writers and artists, like not just in, in our world and in like the punk and hardcore space, but all, just across like throughout all pop music or whatever. I, I hear that a lot too, where it's, um, you know, it, some people are really good at coming up with a mix of cohesive parts that you mentioned the word concept, right? So you have yeah. a concept in your head, right? Like a feeling, maybe it's like, okay, this song is, you know, some people, if they want to get real ethereal about it, it's like, this song is this kind of like bluish turquoise energy, you know, and other people are yeah. like, I kind of see it living in this really aggressive, grindy space, very dynamic, very spiky, whatever. Um, but you can kind of hear that and feel that. So you can dump a lot of those parts out real quick that all work together um but then the the unbiased reordering of them is actually something that uh that you can only really get if you go outside of your own head right because you've thought about it you almost have before you even drop something out into a laptop you almost have pre-demoitis right like just because you've been thinking about it so much which is something um you know I, i don't think a lot of people think about but it's like even before you write it you already have started making up your mind about what yeah. its purpose is, what it's, that's why actually when, when Tom and I, it's the same way. It's like, we, I don't always, I, sometimes you have to do it, but it comes down to a nomenclature language where if you start and you probably, you know, working with other bands, other, you know, uh, even like outside of a day to remember that you might like produce or write with. Right. I, I'd imagine y- you might be inclined to do the same thing where it's like, well, let's not call it uh, a bridge just yet. You know, yeah. let's just do part A, part B, part C, whatever it is. Um, yeah. Because sometimes even that kind of language can color you out of, you know, a, a huge like flip the script kind of moment that makes those songs what they are. So that's awesome that you had that perspective there on a day to day basis. Yeah, totally. And that's one of the things like I was saying that I really I learned and I took away from that process. Um, was not try you know to at least try to like step away from the song that i've written and then come back to it and think about each part not really as what they are set in stone but like what they could be you know like yeah. this part this part might sound like a like a 
like a breakdowny bridge, but it could be a cool chorus if the right melody's over it, you know. And that's you know I I've been writing that way ever since. I didn't even think about it before I, I ever worked with Chad, so that yeah. was like a it was a big deal for me. Dude, it reminds me of something too that I um I think uh, maybe it was uh, Chris Conley uh, saves the day like a conversation we were having years ago when we were out with them talking about uh, like records and like a producer and he was like dude a good producer is really just someone that's great at sifting for gold and finding yep. that like nugget and knowing how to how to really use it the most effective way and what's interesting about that and I can relate this too like you came into this as a guitar player right you're probably writing with a guitar in your hands like the majority of the time if not the whole time right you know so a lot of the guitar based stuff might come first but just because it's you know it like from a linear standpoint of where those ideas come from uh you might get to that gold as like the third or fourth part in that group of you know stuff and it takes somebody to come in and be like that's your best spot you got to just lead with that you know and totally. you're like but it was the it was like the third thing it's got to be like the evolution of the bridge it's like nah it doesn't um and that yeah. dude that objectivity is so cool i'm so glad you brought that up um so when it when it comes to so you ha- you're you're pouring um, all these ideas out, and I love the fact too that you mentioned you try to write like full songs, right? Even if they're right. going to mix them up, I think that's also really um, important. And I want to kind of put a pin in that for our audience too, because I know a lot of people um, very very often struggle with finishing songs. They're like, cool, I can come up with a cool riff, a cool idea, but it's not really going to get you as far as doing what you're talking about, which is let's frame something out. It doesn't have to be finished. It doesn't have to be final. It doesn't have to be perfect, but let's frame out the whole house and then decide if we want to like move this room over here and, and vice versa before you like go and put the shingles on and the siding and all that stuff. Um, so I love that you do that. I think that's really that speaks a lot, especially when you kind of have two ends of the genre spectrum. Yeah. Kind of. And there's a lot of influences getting distilled into that. I think writing, um, you know, full songs as they come up helps with that cohesion, too. Um, and it's probably something you learned along the way. Right. Oh, 100 percent. I mean, that's one of I mean, that's just not one. That's the sole reason I write that way. You know, I, I, I know that if I just write a part and walk away, it's just, I'm never going to probably never going to use it. You know, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I know that I have to write a complete song, even like I would say 50% of the time. Cause I write, I write a lot. I write like every single day and I have my whole life pretty much. So like, I know that 50% of the things that I write, like when I sit down and I write a full song, 50% of the time, that song is not going to be the same when I'm done with it. You know, I'm just getting it out. It's like I have a feeling, I, I have like inspiration and I'm trying to get out of my my body, I guess, into, into the song. So I'll sit down and I write, try, it's complicated to explain. Um, I, I try to feel the emotion that I'm trying to, to, to to, to like put into the music and I and I, I focus on that feeling as I'm writing and I'll write the song and I'll like you know I'll, I'll maybe take a break and walk away and come back and listen to it again and then I start I'll go in and start editing it and I really start like cleaning it up and changing the stuff I don't really like and moving parts around and that's just it's kind of how I, I've always written but it's so it's really important for people to, to have to, to write an entire song, in my opinion, because it, it, it helps you for one. It's like a roadmap, you know, to it also like it, it inspires you because like if you just have parts like like it's not a, it's not even like it's not a song. So like it's going to be really hard to envision like a final like product i feel like you know i feel like envisioning or hearing the final thing is is a it's good inspiration for trying to get that piece of music to that that finish line you know dude the editing the do it walk away come back re yeah. like reframe the ear it's like a you know we talk about this a lot with mixing stuff right it's like you got to take a break and come yeah. back you know with some objectivity otherwise you're you know you, you're gonna be like ah, i didn't need to boost that i was i'm an idiot you know like do oh, it yeah. like in the same way you're like i sat down i was bored until 30 seconds in when that second part hit i should that's that should just rip it off like right off the top right dude you also mentioned um i want to dive 
dive into this because I think this is something that like I love um, from like like thinking about like creativity in this way, but also songwriting. And I, I think it really does make a huge difference in how the product comes out and the authenticity like we were talking about specifically with Homesick. You mentioned getting inside like the emotion of a song, right? The concept and really trying to live there. What are some things that, you know, that you do, especially like writing every day, right? It's like a muscle. You got to keep it in shape and you got to like get in the habit of being able to show up and do it on demand. And that's a tough skill. How do you try and get inside the idea and the headspace of a song and that emotion? Well, one thing that I do that is really important for me is when I know that I'm going to be working with somebody, I do like mental homework, you know, uh, leading up to it. I think about it. I think about the band. I listen to their music. I think about just, you know, I, I think about what their fans expect or want to hear. I put my, I try my best to put myself in the shoes of the fans listening to music. I do that with everything that I write. Like I, I'll, I'll write something and then I'll really like try to listen to it with like, with fan ears, if that makes sense. You know, I try to like, yeah, you know, cause like we, li we, li like as songwriters, we're listening to music totally different than like our fans. do, And, and I really think it's important to try to put yourself in, in their shoes. Cause it's for them, you know, really it's for them. So I do that a lot. And I just try to stay focused on, on the music. And I try to, you know, make sure that my, my creative like zone is is constantly focused on what I'm what I'm doing and like I, I try not to get distracted you know emotionally or literally you know what I'm saying so yeah it's really important to try to stay in in the zone of the music you're trying to write you know it's really easy to get distracted and especially in today today's world yeah of <laughs> so. course Taking a minute here to shout out our good friends at Sheet Happens Publishing, back with us again for season three. They are a company that works directly with artists to create accurate and immersive tab books, vinyl, and other merch that allows fans to get one step closer to perfecting the soundtrack of their lives. As many of you may know, I had the pleasure of working side by side with them to put together a book for my band, The Wonder Years, and believe me, they are incredibly thorough and always dedicated to artist approved accuracy in every one of their books. Every tab book comes with the accompanying guitar profiles, which allow you to jump right into playing along with all of your favorite tracks. So all you need to do is head over to SheetHappensPublishing.com to check out everything they have to offer and be sure to enter the code TRP15 at checkout for 15% off your first purchase. Or you can find the link in our show notes. And again, that's promo code TRP15. Tom, given that you are writing every day. Do you give yourself like restrictions as far as like when you're setting up this, like when you're setting up to write a song either for yourself, for anyone, like is there a restriction, like an actual template, like in like Pro Tools, Logic, whatever doll that you're working in that like you're like, this is the guitar tone, this is the drums, here it is, I, I, I'm writing now. And like, it's just like all right there, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I have a, I, I use the same Pro Tools template. Um, it's all ready to go. It's it's pre-mixed, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so it's yeah. like, you know, all the superior drums are mixed. Mm -hmm. I record DI and then reamp after I'm done writing. Mm -hmm. and, Love that, yeah. And, you know, my mix bus is is ready to go. It's just all bypassed. So, you know, that's, that's how I, I've written for a long time. Just because, like, sometimes I need to hear what the thing I'm working on is going to sound like finished, mixed and mm -hmm. mastered. Sometimes I need to just feel it as it's like, as, as it's like, like final product. And, you know, I can do that just by turning some plugins on. It may sound different, but you know, it, it helps with inspiration if I get stuck or something. Yeah, of course. And like in a, like a complete genre change, I feel like that's pretty standard for all these, like going to throw you in with like the high functioning, like songwriter producers, I think the electronic band Disclosure, like every, like they have a logic session, everything's up, everything's ready to go. And like, there's so many plugins, there's so many choices that you can make that like, I, I feel like that can go into the distractions that you were saying. So 100%, that's another reason I do it, you know, is because I don't want to be a, a mixing while I'm writing. I don't want to think about anything, you know what I'm saying? Like, because when mm -hmm. I write, I'm sure it happens to you guys too. I get 
deep in like the flow zone you know like i get like the world disappears you know until i'm finished writing i don't know if it's like just a different part of my brain i can't even think about mixing or anything i just want to be able to like get it out as fast and and clean as possible while i'm writing and then i can come back to it what i love about the idea of like you walking through and having kind of a pre-mixed template almost too i, I was talking with uh with an artist about this the other day it actually uh, doing it that way probably provides a lot of clarity on relying on really sound composition and part design more so than be like when we mix it it'll it'll be yeah. right you know like yeah. you immediately know does this riff work and can it carry this part or am I fooling myself because you can just throw that mix chain on and be like, yeah, this is going to work or be like, yeah, no, it needs a substantive, like actual, like rhythm line behind it. Or I thought the melody was cool. It, it feels like it's, it's pretty like vanilla when everything's all in it. I should, I should go back and, and write something that pops a little bit more. Right. So it, like, it kind of gives you that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. 100%. And that's like, you know, that's one of the things I used to hate about, you know, writing and demoing and going to the studio is like, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, before like it was, everything was in the box, you had to kind of guess what it was going to sound like and, and hope that the part, parts you were writing were going to sound good when it was all together and mixed and everything. And you had to wait sometimes years for that. And, and it drove me fucking nuts, you know? And I think the, that frustration, you know, really, you know, forced me to find a way to to write the way I do now, you know, and to make sure I can get it at least sounding as, as, as good as I possibly can in the moment and not have to think about it. I want to hear the finished product, obviously, like as fast as possible, you know. And sometimes even like hearing it like that will inspire me to write something or write it differently or, or put it somewhere else. So did you have when uh, when you had Andrew with you on tour, was it was that his kind of role where you were like, all right, track it. And he could actually kind of mastermind, pull some faders, like notch it in, like EQ something, set it in there so that you could kind of like spit something out, riff it, double it and then come back five minutes. And he'd be like, here's what it here's what it will sound like. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely it was basically the same thing. It was uh, uh, I can't remember, 2008, so it wasn't as as good as now, like the quality of things now, because of what the technology wasn't there yet. But it, yeah, right. it was based. It was basically like that's that's how we did it. And that Homesick was the first record that we we did that with too. You know, like before that record uh, writing you know it's like you, you didn't we didn't really demo things we wrote you know the song and memorized it you know what i'm saying yeah. like there wasn't a lot of like options to like you know demo things like there is now and so when we when we were getting ready to do homesick we really wanted to be able to like listen to you know like demo the song and bounce it and listen to it you know like the next day or as, as long as we want and that was a big part of the process too it's like the whole band listening to everything as we were writing it and adding their two cents you know yeah well so tom i want to like zoom back to like the restructuring process and all that kind of like stuff and like zoom in on honestly the opening track because it's such a bold call to open yeah. how it opens now like was that something that you threw out from the beginning is that is that how it opened in your head was that a chad thing was that like how did that come about like what like specifically on that song that was a jeremy idea oh so cool yeah this is a long time ago so i'm trying to uh, <laughs> make sure my memory serves me right but i think one day jeremy said something like he had this dream about this this idea for a part i think that's how it went and he told me i think how he explained it was a weird explanation because i immediately was like i don't think that's gonna be cool like he was <laughs> like i don't exactly remember how he how he uh how he ex explained it to me but it was you know basically probably the worst way to explain what actually what, what we ended up doing but i just remember thinking that's that's weird and i don't know like if that's a good idea but um, I trusted him because like he always had, you know, all the interesting, weird little things on our records like like that were usually a Jeremy idea. He has like really cool ideas when it comes to things like that, that 
add to songs and make them like just make them stand out more like that and so i trusted him i was like you know worst case we can just delete it but i I think he explained it like you know we could uh i want to have a bunch of people mouth the breakdown (laughs) and then go into the breakdown i was like what (laughs) i'm like you mean like a fucking (laughs) like a barbershop quartet or something he's like yeah something like that (laughs) i was like oh Okay, whatever, man. <laughs> but then, you know, we we were, we we tracked the record. We went on tour in Australia, mm-hmm. and Andrew um, did all the group vocals without us, up you know, here. And he, they did that when they did all the group vocals. They did it and they sent it, and I immediately was like, "Oh, this is what you meant." Like I, I was like, "This is not <laughs> what you explained to me." This sounds yeah. so much cooler. Yeah, um, and like I immediately got it as soon as I heard it, obviously. <laughs> and dude, and what's amazing about that, talk about moments, right? Um, sometimes yeah, totally. you sometimes you pull back and dude, this is what I love about songwriting. That that could only come after the breakdown was written and after like all this yeah. other stuff, because it it is a motif, but it's restructuring it. It's almost like what Tom what Tom and I talk about a lot, um, like you see in a lot of pop music now is like the pop overture, right? Like a little like tuck in like a, a little like super low passed version of like the fucked up chorus vocal fragment, you know, in yeah. the first like three to six seconds and then the intro drops or whatever. Right. Um, yeah. It, it, it is that call out, but in such a unique, like a perfectly done way. This song starts. It's sweet child of mine. Everybody knows immediately that it's right. that yeah, song yeah. coming. But it's not a guitar. It's not an acapella vote. It's something much different um, and so cool. And I I mean, I'm sure you ask any a data remember fan. I, I've seen it. I've watched it many times live. That sound clip comes on to start that song and it's <laughs> pandemonium, you know, um, and yeah. I and I love that. It's uh, Tom and I even talk about sometimes like the. You know, it's the my chem version of that. Yeah, (laughs) they don't even he doesn't even get to the second note on that key line. And everybody's like, oh, my God, I know it's this song. Um, So such a cool way. And also just opening the record with it too. all of those things. I want to we wanted to touch on that, too, because I thought it was a really interesting look at taking something that's in the song and figuring out a really unique, authentic um, and interesting way to start songs to grab people's attention. Right. That's an attention grabber for just the song, but then also for the whole record, you know, and uh, I think those are those are cool moments that that are forged out of the songwriting. And uh, but, you know, but come after the fact when when taking that last lens of how can we use this little cool thing and tease it here or, you know, so this part with that part and and have it interesting. Uh, I I love it in such a cool, um, such a cool way to, you know, it takes idea people like that, that are even when the song's done, you could just drop it or, you know, sometimes the most ridiculous like inside joke thing in the studio is what comes out to be everybody's favorite part right 100 percent, yeah we had uh we had sarah tudson of illuminati hotties on the first season of the podcast and she was talking about the fact that like having a trust with your bandmates and everybody that's in the the room while you're writing and in the studio while you're finishing it is super important because only with that trust will someone like throw out a joke when in reality it's like maybe they're just joking but also everybody's like let's try it honestly you yeah. know, after oh. the laughing. And those are the ideas where if somebody's even remotely hesitant about getting like, you know, uh, rejected in some way about then that never happens. You know what I mean? Right. If you for some reason were like, you know, Jeremy paints that picture to you and like does a, you know, not a great job explaining it. And you were like, absolutely not. And and the whole band was like, this is stupid. We won't even you know, we're, we don't even want to try this. This is so dumb. Right. Yeah. That song that never had that moment never yeah. happens. Right. And it's and it becomes such an I- iconic part of the catalog i think it's important for any songwriter to try to get away from the idea that turning things down as much as possible you know i think you have to really be able to freely accept any idea you know i feel like you know you have to like be open to anything in my opinion and you know writing with jeremy for so long um helped me uh it really like shaped how i write in that aspect because he um sometimes he had the craziest ideas like like that you know it's like and it would just come to him and I, you know i i 
I learned to be open to literally anything because um, some you never know. Like, you know, sometimes he'd say some crazy shit and I'd be like, okay, let's try it. <laughs> it, it might be sick, <laughs> especially after that record came out. You know, it was like, yeah, well, now I know like we could do some crazy shit and people will probably like it, you know? <laughs> yeah. W- was there any moment on Homesick that like, I guess from from what you were saying, like, where Jeremy was throwing out some crazy shit. Was there any moment where you're like, oh, let me, let me do this. Let me, let me go down this rabbit hole. Like any like song specific that like you were kind of getting pushback from like the creative collaborative crew that like n- landed and nailed. Um, uh, I don't know about pushback. I did write a song for homesick. That was my favorite song out of all of them that didn't make it. And I was like, I mean, I was like fighting nonstop to get this song in the record. And Jeremy just, he just wasn't comfortable or wasn't like happy with what he, what he wrote vocally for it. And we had to, we had to shelf it. It came, it ended up coming on the next record. It was the song, uh, All Signs Point to Lauderdale. So I wrote that song for Homesick and I was like, it was like my favorite song I've written. And I was like, we have to put this on the fucking record. (laughs) And it just, it just didn't. It just didn't happen. So that was like the only thing I can really think about. Um, I was really fighting for it. And Jeremy was like, I just, I'm not happy with the vocals. Just trust me. We'll, we'll put it on the next record. And, yeah. uh, you know, at the end, we had no choice because I was like, you're right. You're right. So do that. I think we even tracked it. I think we might have even tracked that song. And when he came to, when he was going to do the vocals, he just wasn't feeling it. So, yeah, <laughs> dude, that's so interesting. I was going to ask too. It's like, I think um, anybody that writes with other band members and does it for long enough, you're bound to come across that. Like, no, I love this song. This is like the best riff I've ever written. And right. it only works in this song. And everybody else is like, nah, I hate my part. I think it's bad. And you're like, come on, though. It's so, you know, and sometimes, dude, it's like if your singer doesn't like what they're singing, that's real personal. Um, And it's and and it's tough. So but that is um, a good testament to the idea of keeping things around. Right. Keeping things in your bag of tricks, keeping and just being like, hey, we know something's there. It's not finished yet, but we know there's a lot of goodness to it. And even in like across writing for one record, right. You'll like scrap an idea and have like a, almost a full song like written. And that might, that might not come back until the 11th hour you're in the studio and whoever's working is like, what else you got? I think we need one more like banger to round this thing out. And you're like, well, we do have this and and there it is, you know? So, and that's, and it happens on the next record. Right. So you knew you had something. Um, it was just a matter of time and patience to let it kind of, to let it marinate. For sure. You know, I think at the time I was frustrated because I knew the, how good the record was. And I was like, this song is like, I, I felt at the time that song was, you know, could have been one of the singles. And I was like, it has to make it because like the, the vibe was like perfect with it. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, if, if if Jeremy wasn't comfortable or happy with what he was doing, that's like the most important thing, you know, because like when you're writing music, you know, the vocals are they're the most important thing. You know, I mean, they're equally important. Yeah. But I feel like, you know, you have to keep the vocals in mind when you're writing music, you know, because you're writing for the vocal. And and it's just um, you have especially when you're writing with a singer, you have to be sympathetic to their you know their inspiration and if they're not feeling it you can't push it you can't force it you have to trust them that they uh you know they're making the right call and that's what i did uh, essentially yeah dude how long be honest with us as a guitar player how long um do you think it took before you were like right I should really like think about the vocal here. <laughs> um, cause like, a let's long be, time. <laughs> dude, cause I didn't start out that way. So I'm feeling like, um, I'll, you know, it's probably, um, you know, you don't just wake up and be like, I love, I'm playing guitar here. I'm writing this riff. You know what I should right. do? Throw it out. Cause this vocal's better. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, it took me probably, I mean, it wasn't during homesick. I mean, it was way after that, you know, that just added to, to you know it helped me uh become a writer i am today who is conscious of the vocal i would say i mean i don't know maybe within the last like five years you know i really started focusing on vocals more and 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 it's still sometimes it's really especially when you're not a vocalist which i'm not it's like hard sometimes to 
to do it. You have to, I have to sometimes force myself or remind myself, you know, you know, this is meant for vocals too. It's like, you know, right. So, Cause some, I overwrite a lot, you know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. I'm really good at writing melodies, guitar melodies. And I always write several leads on top of each other. And sometimes there'll be harmonized leads. It's like, it works sometimes, but sometimes when vocals go over it, it gets a little crowded and I have to like remind myself, Hey, I got to chill the fuck out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm getting like, I'm getting too crazy with these melodies, you know, dude. Well, that's, that's a perfect, and I can picture that and relate to all of that very well. It's like, Ooh, I got another little thing that'll work over this. Oh, this, I could also do this. And before you know it, you're like, I'm going to use like 30% of this in the real sun, you know? Um, so what does that look like then to, and, and trying to take all of those lessons and then, um, let's like pivot real quick because you've also uh done a lot of songwriting work um you know outside of a day to remember speaking like recently you know within the past five ten years did some writing uh for that neck deep record life's not out to get you um talk about what that process looked like um how how you got lim- linked up with them and what kind of lessons there you um you use to approach collaborating on those tracks jeremy and Andrew were producing that record. I think it was like either during or right after we did Common Courtesy. So we were already like in the studio together and like inspired, you know. And that record came up. They uh they wanted to write with me and I um I wrote I, I think I wrote all three songs that I wrote on the record before they got there. They came for like three days, sat on the couch in the studio, and we kind of just went over the ideas that I wrote and edited them and like cleaned them up a little bit and, and finished them um, while their singer wrote the catchiest shit I've ever heard right behind me. <laughs> like that dude is such a good melody writer. And like he's like writing as like I'm like writing or finishing the songs and I'm like hearing the catchiest shit right behind my shoulder. I just remember thinking like, God damn, dude. I mean, like, you know, I'm like playing these parts and he's like, I'll be fine. I'm like, holy shit, bro. Like, and that song's like one of my favorite courses on that record. I'm just like, yeah, it just, it felt really good. You know, like, cause I love pop punk. It's my favorite thing to write. It always has been. I just, for some reason, just don't do it a lot. Mm. I don't know. It's just, how it is you know i do a lot i'm I'm doing a lot more now but back then especially that was like the first or maybe you know one of the first times i got to sit down and write pop punk for a really good pop punk band and it just felt really good it was like refreshing and it just worked so well and i mean they i don't don't think they changed anything which makes me feel really good you know (laughs) i love (laughs) yeah of course dude (laughs) always yeah well and that's amazing too like to to see in real time stuff that you conjured up and and put yourself out there to see other people like Ben, like not like just full on being inspired and not being like, okay, like I'll I'll sleep on it, but just be like, uh, immediately I'm writing. Like I'm, I'm, I'm riffing in my head and to see it do that, it it takes it, it kind of takes it back full circle to what you said earlier which I think is so important, like writing as a fan, right? Dude, he's just, he's a fan of this shit before, like long before he was the singer in that band, you know? So hearing that stuff in real time brought out the fan in him, which then tapped the writer on the shoulder and said, let's do this. Let's go. Let's see what comes. Yeah. And to, to be there in the room, what a what like what an amazing thing, because I think a lot of times ideas will get bounced back and forth remotely. And you the one thing in, uh, you know, with technology where there's a will, there's a way to do remote sessions, um, you know, around the globe. But one of the things that I think you often lose is that being in the same place, same time, shared space and energy that you get that just feeds off of each other and and creates this feedback loop. So what a cool thing to 
hear them not only digest that, but to see it in real time impact them and then become a part of their catalog and start to like make it their own um, and, and run with it. So I love that, dude. What a, what a cool moment. And yeah, I mean, clearly that record did right by them. Those songs are fan favorites. I know this <laughs> for a fact. <laughs> um, but um, but dude, uh, this is what a, what a great point to end on. And of course, you've gone on like to continue to write. We're going to honestly, if you're not writing enough pop punk, we're going to have to like we'll come. We'll we'll log on here and we'll write some remote pop punk if you want to do that, yeah, dude. Um, we definitely should do that. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but uh, in any event, um, dude. Dude, congrats on like all the success with that and in and enjoying, you know, the time that you get to do that um, and being grateful for it, because that's that's all I, th- I think all we can we can do as musicians and songwriters is uh, take the opportunities we get and then be appreciative of the time and, and people and space that lets us do it. So thank you. This has been awesome, man. I uh, Tom, I can't uh, stress enough how how much we appreciate you taking the time. And I know our audience will certainly enjoy the look behind this record that I mean, is you know, a huge record, uh, an influential record doesn't really encompass, um, you know, the legacy, the legacy that it's had, um, you know, in this and the greater, like, you know, modern rock community, honestly, at this point. So dude, be well, and we, you will have to stay in touch, uh, with us and keep us updated. Tom, where can anybody, um, either if they want to reach out to you or see some more of the stuff that you've worked on over the years, uh, where can everybody find you? And we'll go ahead and of course, link to it in the show. show notes uh yeah it's just my instagram instagram.com slash tom denny music that's the one i use most so there you go and you got that nice uh james over at stateside you got a whole yep. playlist um if you want to rock all the stuff that you've been a part of and written on there's a lot it's a long there's like 200 plus song dude there's i was like i was like man <laughs> that's this you know uh you can tell that he's not lying that he stays busy well again thank you and please be well we will hopefully talk to you soon you too thank you so much for having me i appreciate it So as a show based around the process of making records, obviously we talk a lot about workflow and the step-by-step order of operations here. But I can tell you firsthand that regardless of how thought out your process is, as a musician that has toured as a part of a band for many, many years now, I have never found it easy to write and demo material on the road. It doesn't matter if you're in a van, bus, whatever, but clearly a day to remember, Tom and all of his bandmates found a way to make it work to their advantage here. And I think partly that is due to the fact that they had some great collaborators with people like Andrew and the fact that they were on tour with Chad at the time so that if they had an idea, they could act on it very quickly and it didn't sit around and get lost in the weeds. With that being said, clearly it worked for this band in that instance. But if it's not working for you, that doesn't mean you have to force it. And there's a path for every album and it's just about going out and finding the right one for you through trial and error. So if you're a songwriter or a producer and you're struggling with fitting all of that in around your lifestyle, whether that be touring or something else, do not lose hope, keep at it. And as always, thank you so much for spending your time with us right here on The Record Process.